Fletcher. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very nice to be back with you once again. Um, you know, for quite a while we've been on at the BBC to put on an amateur talent show, and at last they have agreed to do this, but they've left it a little bit late. As a matter of fact, most of the good talent has already been used. <laughs> However, here is the best of the rest in the BBC's own Opportunity Call. Good, good evening and welcome to Opportunity Calls, the show in which we hope to prove once and for all that the stars of today are truly the unknown artists of tomorrow. <laughs> so here, ladies and gentlemen, we have our first discoverer, Stan Moore from Romford. So you are Stan Moore from Romford. <laughs> no, I am Ron Moore from Stamford. <laughs> I'm married, I have 15 children, and my hobby is flying my kite. <laughs> More. Yeah, well, that really is wonderful, thank you. Really wonderful. Well, tell us, who have you brought along with you this evening, sir? Well, Hughie, I brought along Egbert Nogswip. Eggnog for short. <laughs> well, we want to hear it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for Egbert Nogswip from Eton, opportunity call. <laughs> Just read an interesting article, the most interesting I've ever seen. It told the difference between a fat girl and a girl who's lean. It said both of them may smoke a cigarette, but it's one of life's natural laws. That the fat girl always finishes first, cause she takes bigger draws. I know it's true. I know it's true. I know it's the right thing. I know it's true. It's in the paper. I know it's true. And the fashion editor tells us that the necklines are getting bold. Now wearing the new religious look, it's what they call low and behold. Now the necklines are getting lower, and the skirts go up each week. I don't know where it's all leading, but I'd like to be there when they meet. I know it's true. I know it's right. Paper in black and white. And the readers write to Dr. Jolly Good because he helps them so. If they say they suffer from acne, he says move to Waltham So. A lady wrote that a cartridge had been swallowed by her young son. He says just you keep him wrapped up warm and don't point him at anyone. I know it's true. I know it's right. I know it's right. It's in the papers in black and white. People didn't have far to come. He is Albert Trent from Walthamstow. And tell me, sir, who have you brought along with you this evening? I brought along my cousin Huey Huey. <laughs> Huey Huey. No. His name's Huey. Huey. Uh, your cousin's called Huey, too. No, he's just called Huey. <laughs> well, tell me, sir, when did you first discover that your cousin had this talent? Well, I'll tell you, Huey. Um, one Christmas, like, he, he came up from the West Country, you know, and stayed with us, like, and he was spending all his time up the attic, you know. Well, I thought he might like, have been a bit cold up there, you know, but he won't, because uh, he, like, had Anita up there. Uh, Anita who? They're not the root. Meat up. An oil eat up. <laughs> well, you ask a silly question, you get a silly answer. <laughs> well, anyway, we want to hear him. And now, for your cousin and his fiance, who work under the professional name of Cheddar Cave and Gorgeous. <laughs> Opportunity call. <laughs> Hello then, Johnny. Hello, Gaganoff. Johnny, I hear that you won £75,000 on the football pools last year. That's right, Gaganoff. 75,000 counts. <laughs> Tell me, Johnny, 
What did you do with all the money? I gave most of it to charity. Well, that is very good of you. That's what I keep telling her. <laughs> <laughs> She'll never find another like me. <clears throat> oh, look at that there, eh? Oh, look at her, eh? Oh. Here, if I told you you had a lovely figure, would you hold it against me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> never mind about that. We Wait. Right, so then, well, uh, good help. Thank you. <laughs> then, Johnny, don't keep pushing the girls about. <laughs> well, good help. Here, are you going to drink that, Governor? That's quite right, Johnny. I'm going to drink this. And what am I going to do in the meantime? In the meantime, Johnny, you are going to recite the alphabet. Me recite the alphabet while you drink that <laughs> in Kosovo. <laughs> in Kosovo, impossible, eh? <laughs> well, we shall soon see about that. Off you go. A G C D E. I think that it's time for your little song. OK, Clarissa, music now scratchy. <laughs> and when it's 12 o'clock, we climb the stairs. We never knock, cause nobody Thank you, Cheddar Cave and Gorgeous. That really was most uninteresting. Well, now, friends, I have sitting next to me now Miss Emily Fosdyke. Now, Miss Fosdyke, as the principal of a stage academy and an ex-actress yourself, tell me, what advice would you give to the young, new actors and actresses of, of today? Well, Huey, <laughs> I would say always speak up. Try to emulate Dick Bogart's doctrine. <laughs> always try to project. I mean, uh, always, when you're working, work as if uh, there was nobody in the theatre except one little man sitting all by himself at the back of the gallery. I always did that, and it always worked. Uh, uh, why was that? Because, as a rule, there was no one in the theatre except one little man sitting at the back of the gallery. <laughs> oh, dear. And another thing is, is, is never paraphrase. Uh, what exactly uh, uh, would, you, would you mean by that? Well, for instance, if the script says he was bent on seeing her, then, then you must say he was bent on seeing her, not the sight of her doubled him up. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Well, tell us, Miss um, uh, Falkdyke, uh, do you still act yourself at all? Uh... Oh, heavens above, no. Now, I live in quiet retirement in Rygate with my 12 children and my husband. He's a producer, you know. Uh, sir, uh, madam, uh, madam, <clears throat> who have you brought along with you this evening? Well, Huey, I've brought along three of my pupils who together make up Fred and the Debutantes. For Fred and the Debutantes, opportunity call. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 
Thank you, friends, and on behalf of Edward Nosbury, Peter Cave and Gorgeous, and Fred and the Debutantes, I just want to say keep those letters coming in, will you, because it really is your vote that really counts. Here's the address to write to friends. It's to me, Huey Carlton Green, Television Center. <laughs> I'll just give you that address once more. It's Charlie Pimple, Sister <laughs> Grove, Mitch and Turk. Don't forget, folks, tune in again this time next week and see last week's winners, Kathy Kay and Alan Bree. <laughs> holiday tips from your holiday guide, Jeremy Gulliver. Good evening, viewers. <clears throat> I'm speaking to you from the office of Scuttle Airlines Limited, and they're offering this year what must be one, <laughs> what must be one of the cheapest holidays on record this year. <laughs> Great Britain to the continent by air for only 22 and sixpence. <laughs> and with me now is the managing director, Mr. Fred Scuttle. Good evening, Pa. Good evening, viewers. Good evening, Mr. Scuttle. Well, now, do tell us, uh, Great Britain to the continent by air for 22 and 6 Yes, sir. Well, now, how do you do it? By keeping our overheads down and our un undercarriage up. <laughs> you see, small profits, quick returns. Exactly, sir. Yes, yes, yes. I see. Well, now, uh, tell me, Mr. Scuttle. Uh, uh, Captain what? Scuttle. With the cap. Captain. Uh, Captain yes, Scuttle. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Captain, you're, you're one of the pilots, sir. Oh, indeed, yes. yes I've, I've been at it for years, sir. Flying, that's it. Oh. <laughs> Over to the continent, under the... I've, I've, I've flown all sorts, I have. I've flown the lot, I have. By chance? Oh, yes, sir, yes. Duke, so. <laughs> and you know, even now, sir, I still get a thrill. I still get a thrill now, sir, when I hear the old steps calling out, fasten your safety belts, fags out, chucks away. No sweets, they don't mind, sir. It's all the time. <laughs> it's off. Up into the wild blue yonder, sir. You'll never, you never know what's going to be up there, sir. One minute, sir, you're cruising along with the wind whistling round your fuselage. <laughs> the next minute, sir, you're bobbing about like a puff of wind in a colander. <laughs> Tell me, Captain Scott, how many pilots do you have? Uh, uh, just the one, sir, me. One. Yeah, I am the, the, the pilot. We only have the one plane, you see, sir. Only one I, plane? I'm a first class in pilot, your, pilot, sir. But in your brochure, Captain Scott, it distinctly says you've got a fleet of planes. Where, where's it say that? There, there, fleet of planes. Where, where's it say that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah, so it goes, yes. Oh, that, that, that's a typographical error. That's Phoebe's ah. on that, you see. Phoebe, Phoebe. Oh, she's your secretary, is she? As well, yes. <laughs> as well as what? Well, as well as the, um, the airline stewardess. Sir. <laughs> and where is she now, Captain? Sleeping Scott? it off. <laughs> Sleeping it off? Yeah, well, she had a bit of a busy night last night with you. Oh, you know. The <laughs> trouble is, sir, you see, uh, she can resist anything except temptation, you see. <laughs> I can't get through to her that the drinks are for the passengers, not for her, you see. <laughs> it's a funny girl, but she's the only girl I could get for the money, actually. Oh, how much is that? Yeah, the two pounds a week, sir. Two <laughs> pounds a week, Captain Scuttle. Can she live on that? Oh, yes, sir. That and her old age pension. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, tell me more about this trip. Great Britain to the continent for 22 and 6. Yes, sir. Where'd you take off from? Dragon Tree Airport. Oh, where's that? Out of Hebrides. <laughs> Yes, you take off from the Outer Hebrides, and where do you land? O o on the continent, sir. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Captain's got a whereabouts on the continent. Well, that depends where we run out of fuel. <laughs> we get lost, you see. We don't, we don't commit ourselves, sir. We'll, you'll see it down there. We don't commit ourselves. No, but where do you make for? Uh, Trouville. Uh, Trouville. Well, that's in France, isn't it? Is it? <laughs> yeah, 
Northern Lights. Yes, yes, I'll settle for France. Yes. <laughs> Tell me, Captain Cutler, have you ever landed at Trouville? Oh, two or three times, sir. Yes, at the at the airport? No, no, sir, at, at the tennis club, actually. They, <laughs> they let, we land on, on one of the tennis courts, you see, sir. You land on a tennis court? Yes, sir. Tell me, how on earth do you manage to stop in such a short distance? They leave the net up. <laughs> Captain Scuttle, when is your next flight scheduled? We are flying tonight. <laughs> Sounds like a Chinese chip shop, doesn't it? <laughs> so don't forget, viewers, the cheapest way to the continent, Scuttle Airlines, only 22 shillings and sixpence. Yes, but before you go, Captain Scuttle, yes, yes, you yes. take off from the outer Hebrides, yes, yes. but how does one get to the airport? Oh, we have a boat that goes across from the mainland. Ah, I see, I see. <laughs> now, how much does that cost? Uh, that's 35 pounds single. <laughs> With the new divorce laws, England will become the easiest place in Europe in which to get a divorce. But what's the situation in the rest of Europe? <laughs> My wife is she's so cold-blooded, you know. She's like a refrigerator. I'm a very hot-blooded man. <laughs> Makes life very difficult, huh? <laughs> but now everything is all right. Life is worth living again. <laughs> we have got twin beds. <laughs> but I mean, how does having twin beds help? Hers is in Dusseldorf, mine is in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> the people of Bessarabia no can have the worst. It's forbidden. Uh, my wife, she don't sleep at night. Go to whips, no ties herself to get to sleep. All night long, it's a, a toes to toes. Go to sleep. Feet, feet, go to sleep. Knees, knees, go to sleep. All over, go to sleep, go to sleep. Uh, last night, I accidentally nudged her with my elbow. She says, oh, wake up, everyone. We're going to have a party. Crash, no, you spook. Hey, <laughs> you know, this morning, my wife, she threw a teeth on my head. <laughs> And a chair, and a table, all the time shouting and screaming and kicking. Uh, well, you know, senor, he does have his compensations. Uh? What compensations are they? Senor, when you are married to a woman like that, who's afraid of a little bull? Adios, huh? Mais, monsieur Wicker, le divorce, c'est tellement dégagé. Oh, we say Ray, Metcalf. You see, uh, my husband and I do not have the same behind. <laughs> oh, you mean background? I think. But of course. You see, my father was Le Condamnier. His father was a fisherman from Marseille. Alors, petite cocotte, t'as fini avec ton petit Jésus là-bas, alors, hein? Gaston, you are a pig. <laughs> you are a big, fat, ugly, horrible pig. <laughs> it's all right, he does not speak English. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, you still don't want to get a divorce? Oh, Monsieur Wicker, you have to come to terms with life, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> hey, Coco! <laughs> Alors, c'est la vie, n'est-ce pas, Monsieur Wicker, hein? Et c'est pas mal non plus. Et si, si, hein? Oh! Ah. Oh, quelle jolie terre de fesse, hein? Oh, coquine! Oh, oh, oh. Mm. Oh. I bought her a beautiful home in Amsterdam on the Rembrandt's plank, the flowers of the garden, it was a beautiful house. Twelve weeks after we married, she went off with my best friend. <laughs> and I miss him! Well, our continental cousins might not have the easy divorce laws that we have, but they do have one thing that we British lack. And that is tolerance.
Thank you, Madam Comrade. I will get the menu, Comrade. Long live the gremlin. <laughs> we may have rain later today. But I do not think it will rain tomorrow. <laughs> For every door, there is a key. I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. <laughs> You'll never find hairs on a duck egg. <laughs> but you always find hairs on an ape. It is only the hairs on a gooseberry that stop it from being a grape. <laughs> Don't forget the fruit gums, Mum. <laughs> Hands that do dishes can be soft as your are. Here comes the... <laughs> You order now, comrades? Yes. I have a glass of Georgian white wine with vodka chaser, stuffed Bessarabian vine leaves, Caucasian shaslik, and Siberian peach melba. And you, comrade? I shall have a half a mild and bitter, <laughs> brown Windsor soup, roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, boiled potatoes, a cup of tea with milk but no sugar. There you will, comrade. And I shall have rice pudding for after. <laughs> You don't think he suspects I'm English, do you? Of course. 
not one of us, is he? Of course not, he's one of them. I thought he was the way he went out. <laughs> James, you, you are so observant and so very, very handsome. Yes, I am, aren't I? <laughs> oh, James, I have waited all my life for a man such as you. How wise. <laughs> oh, here comes the waiter. For you, comrade, brown Windsor soup. Thank you. And for you, madam comrade, Caucasian chaslik. I beg your pardon, madam. I am so sorry for being so clumsy. Heavens! That envelope is missing. That swine must have taken it. I hope it didn't contain anything valuable, did it? Only false information, James. What crafty you are. The real information is in the next carriage. I see. Meet me outside my private compartment in five minutes. I have plans. Perhaps they better come in with you. Why? I have plans as well. <laughs> oh, James! James, darling! Please don't leave me. I love you so much. <laughs> Do I know you, madam? But I'm Hilda. I live next door to you in Hampstead. We spent last New Year's Eve together. So we did. <laughs> well, didn't that mean anything to you? Well, I mean, my dear, you mustn't take it to heart so. I mean, I, I'm a secret agent now. I'm licensed to love. <laughs> and this sort of thing happens all the time. You must remember, I'm in the secret service now. Yes, and I'm in the... Now? <laughs> you mean to say you're going to have a... <laughs> this never happens to James Bond. <laughs> and now, we feel we should warn you that the next item is unsuitable for people of a nervous disposition. <laughs> answer it. It'll be another of them monominous phone calls. It'll be that woman again. I don't know who she is. I don't half fancy you. It's a thing to say to a complete stranger. <laughs> and all that heavy breathing. <laughs> Enough to give you the abstaps. Hello, what do you want? Oh, it's you again. I might have known. Well, of course I am, madam. It's half past nine. <laughs> They're blue. <laughs> I'm 42 round the chest, 44 round the waist, and my other measurements for my own business have nothing to do with you whatsoever. You'd like to what? That's the most disgusting suggestion I ever heard. Besides, where could we go? <laughs> Don't you dare come round here. If you do, I shall set the police on you. Now go away, madam, and stop pestering me. Oh, golly. <laughs> night after night, it's the same thing. She might be a psychopath for all I know. <laughs> she might commit some hyena's crime. <laughs> Why don't you go and wash your mouth out with soap and water, you dirty, filthy... Oh, hello, Vicar. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, Vicar. No, it's all right. I had to get out of bed to answer the phone. <laughs> no, no, well, Vicar, you see, I was, I was lying in bed just now talking to this woman. On the phone, Vicar. <laughs> well, that's just it. I don't know who she is. She keeps ringing up and making odd suggestions. She keeps asking me what colour my vest is. <laughs> it's white. Why? <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't know any women, Vicar. Only, only the woman at the hostel across the road. And it wouldn't be her. Well, she well, it just wouldn't be her, that's all. Because she's a Lebanese. <laughs> They've got a different attitude, Vicar. Well, there's only the girls at work, but it wouldn't be one of them, would it? Would it? Surely not. You look tired this morning. Didn't you sleep well? Is something trouble? 
troubling you. Miss Crimp. <laughs> would you come here a moment, please? I should like you to do something for me. Oh, what? Say I don't half fancy you. Oh, Mr. Treasurer, I never knew you cared. <laughs> Not me, you, you, me. I want you to say it. Say I don't half fancy you. I don't half fancy you. Well, put a bit of lust into it. <laughs> I mean, a bit of passion. Say it in me ear. I don't half fancy you. Not finish your breakfast yet, Miss <laughs> Oh, sir. I'm oh, sorry. I think I'd better get back to China. Yes, you have. I'll see you later. Now, look here. Take off! What's going on here? I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do. The whole place is going to pot. Look at this sign you wrote. How would you like to see your girlfriend in this for 12 shillings? Well, it's all right. It belongs in millinery under one of the bonnets. But I found it in hardware in a zinc bath. <laughs> what about this from the photographic department? Well, it's only the picture of a baby. But you sent it to a honeymoon couple. And look what you've written on the back. Please say how many you want. <laughs> What size? <laughs> Do you want them in sepia? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. Cyril. <laughs> now, something's upsetting you, isn't it? You can tell me what is it. Well, sir, I, I keep getting these phone calls. Phone calls? Yes, it's like a voice on the phone. It keeps ringing up. Well, what does it say? It says, I don't half fancy you. I don't half fancy you. <laughs> no. It was deeper than that. It was a woman. I tell you, she's threatening to come round. I tell you, I'm absolutely terrified. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Mother, I'm home, Mother. Mother Angel. Mother, my treasure. Mother, love. Oh, fuck that old crow in a minute. <laughs> Mother. Hello. Dear son, I'm writing this slowly because I know you cannot read very fast. <laughs> I have gone to Auntie Louise for the night. I'll be home in the morning. <gasps> oh, sacred blue. There's no wrong night. <laughs> Touch me. Hi, pretty boy. Hello, Poochie. You're a real Poochie. I know. <laughs> what does she mean, Poochie? She means you're very attractive. <laughs> I know that as well. Put down my ruby type South African Algerian cherry. <laughs> Leave my boy's own paper alone. Oh, that's you wouldn't understand. It's for fellas anyway. It's not for good. Hey, what's this there? Here, give me that. It's my key. And now, now, Tiger. If you don't give me that key, I shall take it by force. Will you? Yes, I will. No, I won't. Cool, I don't know what happened to you. So it's you. So you're the one who's been phoning up making these improper suggestions. Well, you can pack up those thoughts right away, because I don't believe in that sort of thing. Well, not before marriage anyway. And I'm none too sure about afterwards, I am. <laughs> you want to try and kiss me? No, no, no. <laughs> there. Now, what good's that done you? Here, save some for me. No, oh, please don't, oh, please don't, oh, please don't. Oh. <laughs> My, it's warm in here. You're shameless, you are, shameless, shameless. Cool, look at this, it's Lawrence Harvey. I don't suppose you'll be satisfied if you kiss me at all. Oh, you've got to be joking. Hey, who's that out there? Yeah, it's shocking, of course. Oh, we're going to go out of here. Bye, Tiger. Are Tiger. you going? Hello, Tom. Tom, the most terrible things happened. Three girls broke in. They were holding me hostage. <laughs> no, Tom, me hostage. <laughs> they were, like, kissing me and pressing themselves up against me and, and, and all sorts of... Uh, I'll see you later on. <laughs> help! 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 I'm trapped! Come back! Thank
gentlemen, we are very happy to have with us in the studio tonight two very good friends of ours, and I know they're friends of yours too. Here they are then, back from their latest travels, Armand and Mikhaila Menes. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight we're going to show you, with the aid of some photographs, our latest journey in Africa. Africa. I expect also you'll be able to meet Mikhaila's latest little pet. <laughs> well, it was at the end of January we first arrived at the mouth of the Punjan River, and we were met there by the men of the tribe, and they seemed very interested in our motor-driven launch. But the ladies were much more reserved. They seemed to think that Armand was going to attack them. <laughs> Yes, they even went so far, even went so far as to carry little knives with which to protect themselves. This was quite unnecessary. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> Perhaps they were taken aback. I think they were taken aback by uh, my direct approach, which is never, ever done. Well, I asked a Ubangi, or plate-lipped lady, the way, the way to the Yakula jungle, and she replied, Yakula, Nakahula, Lakula which means I cannot answer you because you are standing on my lower lip. <laughs> but she was an interesting girl, not just a pretty face. Now, the natives of the Punjab River, unlike many tribes in Africa, do not practice polygamy. They are very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> They're a very excitable race, and on feast days or like luau's, the they sing and dance to their sun god. It's all very, very impressive as they dance up and down on red-hot coals and broken glass and red-hot coals and all sorts of broken things like glass. <laughs> and it, uh, it doesn't hurt them a bit. Because they wear big hobnail boots. <laughs> but Armand got very attached to a Yubangi or plate-lipped lady. Yeah, well, you see, yes, she captured and tamed no fewer than 47 different varieties of African wild birds. Of course he Here is one. <laughs> this is the trumpet bird. Unlike many of the other African birds, the trumpet bird only has one mating season per year. This lasts for 12 months. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no female of the species. The trumpet bird is a very unhappy bird. <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is the OB bird. The uh, OB bird is the smallest of the African wild birds and weighs only one and a quarter ounces. Yet every year, it, it lays an egg weighing two and a quarter pounds. Needless to say, the OB bird is also a very unhappy bird. <laughs> There's a very friendly rivalry among the natives that live on either bank of the Punjab River. On the north live the Mopos, and the Mopos are fishermen. Fishermen. They're absolutely fearless Mopo. as they wade about in this alligator-infested river, spearing fish. Absolutely fearless, the Mopos, wading about among the alligators. Yes. And the, the Ulas on the south bank, the Ulas, they are craftsmen. They make their living by manufacturing wooden legs for the Mopos. <laughs> <laughs> like a circle, it goes round. <laughs> we were helped on our way by our native guide, Tambor, and he was very expert at catching the many shellfish that lived on the banks of the river. Here is Mikaela admiring his muscles. <laughs> and his cockles. <laughs> We arrived at the Yakula jungle. Now, oh, it was very hot, I must tell them. It was very hot in the jungle. We had to wear our pith helmets. <laughs> the jungle was a mass of lush tropical vegetation uh, surrounding a small inland sea. And it was here in this inland sea that we found a very rare freshwater female soul. And it lived in this inland sea for 20 years. And yet, during all that time, no male soul had ever found its way into the Inland Sea. Poor old soul. <laughs> yeah, cool jungle. Oh, yeah. oh, the... oh, oh. <laughs> he wants to play. That's my little bestie. For a minute, I thought it was you. I <laughs> hear <laughs> Sorry, but uh, Mikhail's pet's so precious this time of the year. Yes. The Yakulo jungle is inhabited by two distinctly different tribes, the Watutsis and the Pygmies. Now, the Watutsis stand about six feet four, and they wear fig leaves. And the Pygmies stand about four foot six, and they wear tea leaves. <laughs> Pygmies, they're great storytellers. 
and they love to tell the story of the great white father who came to visit them and stayed with them for 40 years because he loved them and because he wanted to help them. And because he couldn't find his way out of the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> They love... She has eaten a piece of my hat. <laughs> they love to tell the story also of how the great white father one day went walking through the jungle and came across a lion that was limping because it, it had a thorn in its foot. And he went up to the lion and lifted up its paw and took the thorn out. And the lion went over to him and licked him to show him how grateful it was. And then it ate him. <laughs> Come on, now, time you were getting off home, eh? Isn't what it? What have I Come done, Elaine? What have I done? Now, look, we can't have glass all over the place now, can I've we, done eh? Nothing, I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not hurting anyone, am I? Don't we, eh? Now, come no. on, old lad. Come on, now. Look, we've got to get out of here. Now, look, look at that glass. Oh, now, is that your glass? Oh, all right, all right. Well, look, be a good lad. You behave yourself. Good. <laughs> you want to get on up and lick the inspector's boots, you do, mate. Stop interfering with people. <laughs> no, not you, mate. Here, our coppers are all alike, aren't they? They're all alike, they're coppers. Anyway. Interfering all the time, then. Well, I didn't say I was. No, no, not you, mate. You want to break your thighs right out of your throat, do you? No, mate, no. How do you like this in your ugly bush? Help, help, help. Officer Lee. Officer, help, Lee. I'll tell you what the police are. The police, police farce is a farce. The police farce is a farce. We have all been brainwashed into believing things are what they're not. And they're not. I mean, what happens? It's television, isn't it? I'll tell you what happens. Somebody on television commits a hyenas crime. They steal a diamond about that big. And what happens? Inspector Lockhart rings up uh, Interpol. Interpol get in touch with one of the four just men. And they apprehend the criminal in a penthouse in Rome in 25 minutes. <laughs> My bicycle pump was stolen three weeks ago. <laughs> I haven't seen it or heard of it since. And I'm not the only one. The vicar leaves his bicycle outside the battered trumpet every evening. And three times he's had his bicycle pump stolen. The police told him to take his bicycle pump in with him. He did, and they stole his bicycle. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's time the police apprehended some of these hooligans. There are too many hooligans running loose. It's time the police did something about it. Well, they've got no sense of humour, have they? And they absolutely ruined our rag week. We had a super jape on, too. Oh, God. You know what we did? We went into the local park and we, we tore up all the flowers, chopped down all the trees, <laughs> chopped up all the park benches and threw them all over the place. They were absolutely super. And the police didn't like it a bit. Why did you do it in the first place? To call attention to the charity that we were supporting. And what was that? Preservation of British parks. <laughs> Well, one well, has to keep in with them, doesn't it? <laughs> As a matter of fact, we've invited the commissioner along to the party tomorrow night at the Ladies' Institute. <laughs> Might be a little dull, though. I understand he is also the chairman of the Anti-Drink League. <laughs> Not the Anti-Drink League. He's the chairman of the Anti-Vice League. Oh. Well, I knew there was something we shouldn't <laughs> offer him. <laughs> anyway, now we get down to parking, will we, eh? What's <laughs> my consolation? <laughs> Well, a policeman, I had no right talking to Ted like that and showing him up in front of all these people. No, I'll admit he was doing over 30 miles an hour down a one-way street on a steamroller. And I will admit that he had no lights and he had had a few. But the policeman had no right showing him up in front of all these people. Well, at least he didn't arrest him. Well, he couldn't arrest him, though, could he? I mean, he's only eight. <laughs>
Good evening. I'm speaking to you from the interrogation room of a police station. And I have, I have with me here Chief Inspector Fred Scuttle. Good evening, sir. Inspector. Good evening, viewers. Remember, crime does not pay. <laughs> really? Well, it doesn't for me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, Inspector, in spite of what you've just said, how do you account for the rapid increase in crime? Women, sir. <laughs> the women is responsible, sir. They, they egg the fellas on, you see. They do, I mean, look, 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 look at this girl here, sir. Naughty Nora. <laughs> Norwood. <laughs> I mean, look at her, sir. You see, that girl eggs the fellas on, you see. I and mean, she leads men into a life of crime, sir. She's very attractive. I know, sir, but a girl like that could ruin a man. <laughs> she was lucky. <laughs> And look at the lady shoplifters, sir. The statistics is going up all the time, sir. Mind you, luckily, sir, we do have a very high percentage of convictions. Ah, what are the figures like? Very nice, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean, sir. Yes, well, the, the percentage is very high, sir, yes. But it's very difficult for the lads on the beach, you know, sir. Indeed. Well, they have to catch them with the goods on them, you see, sir. Very difficult. <laughs> I mean, one of our lads, last week, he was outside this greengrocer's shop, sir. He saw this skinny streak, he saw this girl <laughs> going in, skinny she was, sir. And two minutes afterwards, out comes this well-rounded <laughs> lady. <laughs> and two minutes afterwards, the manager comes out and says, two melons is missing. <laughs> Well, I mean to picture the constable's predicament, sir. Yes, I can, I can. Uh, what did he do? Well, he ran after her, sir, tapped her on the shoulder, she turned round, and there he was, sir, face to face with two of the... one of the... <laughs> most difficult problems to, a constable could face, you see, sir. I mean, he knew she had the goods on her. <laughs> he couldn't put his hands on her. <laughs> You see, you see, if he, he could have had her for theft, but she'd have had him for assault. <laughs> and then he found out. Who well, found out what? She was foreign. Ah, I see, she was a tourist. No, an old fair girl, sir. <laughs> now then, you see, sir, she didn't speak a word of English, and he had to explain what he was after. <laughs> in mime. And he lacks the subtlety of Marcel Marceau. <laughs> see? Yes, I see. Was an arrest finally made? Yes, sir, finally an arrest ah. was made, sir. But we got him off. <laughs> he pleaded insanity. <laughs> he said he was mad about melons. <laughs> You do understand, it's all very... Well, it's not all George riding around in dead cars, you know, sir. I mean, it's all right, the public jeering at us, sir, I know. But, sir, as soon as they're in trouble, it's 999 like a shot, isn't it, sir? Yes. I mean, only last night a fella phoned up. He said he said he had been attacked in his own garden, bashed on the head, sir. We sent a constable round and he got bashed on the head as well, sir. Uh, but did he catch the assailant? No, sir, he trod on the same rake. <laughs> It's not just this, or an escort duty, sir. That can be very difficult, you know, sir. I mean, a young constable, plainclothes man, has to escort a criminal, we'll say, from London all the way to Dartmoor, by rail. That can be a very hazardous, very embarrassing journey, sir. Yes, but surely the prisoner's handcuffed to the plainclothes man. Exactly, sir. <laughs> and it's a long way to Dartmoor. <laughs> Well, you never know. I mean, so the prisoner might want to go and have a cup of tea, sir? <laughs> or anything. I mean, the mind boggles, doesn't it? Yes. My yes. does, anyway. <laughs> right, Inspector, but of course, you're far more concerned with actually catching criminals. Oh, we catch them, mm. sir. It's not... Look, look, sir. Only yesterday morning, Scotland Yard sent us photographs of 13 vicious criminals, sir. We already have 12 of these men under lock and key, and we ought to have the 13th under lock and key by nightfall tonight, sir. But, Inspector, yep. uh, these are all different photographs of the same man. <laughs> are they, sir? Yeah. So, so they are. Yeah, well, he'll be amongst the money. <laughs> he'll be down there in the cells with the money, that fellow. Yes, but, Inspector, by nightfall, you're going to have 13 men locked up and only one of them is going to be the suspect. Ah, but we'll have our man. He'll be there, won't he, sir? <laughs> yes, but what are you going to tell the other 12? We'll have to kid him on there a jury, won't we, sir? Not bad on you, sir. No, I thought you might have one. 
This, then, is Britain's police force, considered by many to be the finest in the world. Perhaps it would be well to cease name-calling and jeering and give them, our police force, the respect they so richly yeah, deserve. Yeah, old black stockings. Right, right, you're a kind of sexy bitch, aren't you? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't mind being in the arms of the Lord tonight. Oh, what about you on the right end? Oh, sexy. I love you back stockings. What are you doing tonight, then, love? Oh, sexy, aren't you? The club love you. Oh, oh, stockings and the skirts. Oh, Oh, look at him. Come on, come on, come on. What are you doing? Oh, I don't Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most popular programmes on commercial television last year was Lady Birds, in which the cameras went behind the scenes and gave you a peep into the private lives of well-known pop girl singers. Well, we thought it was time that the pop boy singers had a chance. So here is the BBC's answer to Lady Birds. It's called Laddie Boys. <laughs> son because <laughs> he's been um keen on the rhythm music you know like ever since he got that electric guitar oh yeah and um, he got it at the works raffle he won it no he organized it <laughs> and, um, like then then he joined this group of singers you know didn't i have some funny names <laughs> i was um there was bush bushel head and, and knuckles and four eyes <laughs> they were lovely girls though <laughs> But they're so proud of uh, my boy now. Around here they are. But at, his la at the last school prize giving, they asked him not to go along and, and give out the prizes and uh, oh, take, yeah. you know, charge and, and everything up there. Only um, he had like a kipper for his lunch, and I think it was a bit off because he had like a plane, you know, and he, he couldn't go along and um, sort of um... officiate. Yes, it was a kipper he ate. <laughs> I thought it was officiate. Boy. He is really, I mean, you couldn't wish to have a nicer brother than Ernie. <laughs> oh, oh dear. <laughs> you didn't know his name was Ernie, did you? <laughs> well, it is Ernie, yes. Ernie Poultney. Still, I suppose Ernie Poultney's not a very good name for oh, a pop no. singer, is it? But I, of course, retain the name of Poultney, where I work at Niggles Hardware Store. But then, of course, I work a whole year to make the same amount of money as Ernie gets for making one gramophone record. <laughs> Still, that's life, I suppose. Not that I grudge at him at all, because he's a lovely boy, he really is. <laughs> Generous to a fault. <laughs> yes, he's a lovely lad. I mean, he's, he's good to his mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's admired and he's respected. And uh, he's decent and he's clean living. I only wish I could say the same about some of those little scrubbers that he knocks about with. <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> Still, that's only a uh, text, I mean. <laughs> Mind, of course, it hasn't been easy for him, you know, because he had a hard life. I mean, he left school at 14 and he was out of work for the next 11 and a half years. Oh, how old did he tell you he was? 19. Did he really? Oh, well, I never. <laughs> oh, 19, eh? Well, that would be, um, yes, five years he was out of work. Well, he couldn't do any heavy work, you see, on account of his back. Oh, what's wrong with it? It's got a yellow streak down it. That's what's wrong with it. <laughs> well, he, he's your, he is your brother, you know. No, Mother, I will speak my mind. I will, I will. I mean, look at the things he's, the tricks he's pulled on me. What about my bicycle pump, then? What about my bicycle pump? Mm. Three years I never had my bicycle pump back. And what about Angela and the baby? You don't know about Angela and the baby, do you? Oh, he's a lovely boy. Like, I tell you, Sonic, when he was left school, he was out of work for a bit, like, and his mum, she had to keep him by taking him washing. And I'll say one thing for that boy. He wasn't a shame. He wasn't a bit of shame. <laughs> he knew, you see, he knew she wasn't strong enough to do heavy work, see. Oh, I wouldn't well, say that. I mean, that. since he got on, he can't do enough for her. Like, he bought her a wash tub, he bought her and a mango and a scrubbing brush and all that sort of thing, you know. Well, <laughs> oh, I knew he'd get on because he got it up there, see. I tell you something, we used to be out with the uh, 
with his scrap iron on the old horse and cart, you know, and he used to put the blinkers on the horse and get on the cart, and he used to say, hey, go on there, go on, Dobbin, go on, Jackie boy, go on, Charlie boy, get up there, Nettie, you know. <laughs> How many horses did he have then? Yeah, only the one, but with the blinkers on him, you see, and hearing all the other names, you know, he thought there was a lot of other horses helping him, so he used to put a bit on, and I knew he'd get on that boy, I knew it, knew he'd get on. Here's that great star, Tex Symbol, with his latest hit, joined by Patsy Ann Noble in Our Garden of Love. Oh, the sun and the rain fell from up above and landed on the earth below in our garden of love. Oh, there's a rose for the rain. Forget me not to remind me To remember not to forget A pine tree for the way I pined over you And an ash for the day I asked you to be true And the sun and the rain Fell from up above Until then, on behalf of us all, good night and God bless.